First off, we have to understand ground bounce. Ground bounce is a problem caused by high inductance in pins of ICs. Switch mode power supplies that have the FET and the diode built into the controller IC usually have ground bounce problems because the IC pins have very high inductance. And that's a function of not having adequate ground pins in the field with the signal pins. <clears throat> Sorry. And um, the only way to, to solve that is to look for controllers with a lot of ground pins mixed in with the, with the signals or pull the FET and the diode out of the controller, which is what things used to, we used to design switchers with the FET and diode external. And if you do that now, you can solve the problem. People I know who really want to, to have switchers that work properly don't buy controllers with the diode and the FET in the controller. First off, there's a lot of talk these days about cutting the ground plane below the switch node to prevent oscillation of the circuit. The problem is when you cut the ground plane below the switch node, it causes the electric and magnetic fields to spread and that creates other problems. And so one of the things I tell people is even though that's been talked about a lot, it's something you should never ever do. Just simply don't do it. And another thing to keep in mind when you have components that are routed relative to ground, don't pour copper underneath those components because you interfere with the ability of the fields to couple to the plane on the next layer. You simply have to keep the discontinuity that's generated short. And the way you do that is by knowing how long it can be. And that's a, that's a more complex question than I can really answer here easily. Um, I would almost need to show on a presentation, but if you have really fast edge rates of uh, on an IC output, let's say 500 picosecond edge rates, you can have a discontinuity caused by the soldering of the component of a half inch or more. And as long as the discontinuity is shorter than that, it won't impact the impedance of the line. So you, you can't stop it. So you have to just figure out when's it okay and when isn't it okay. And that too is a function of the rise and fall time of the, of the digital square waves. A digital square wave that has a 500 picosecond rising edge can tolerate a discontinuity of an inch or more. One with a 200 picosecond edge rate can only tolerate a discontinuity of probably a third of that. So you can have discontinuities in transmission lines as long as they're short relative to what the signal speed is. With RF circuit boards, the best way to prevent noise coupling into the RF signal is to use what's called a coplanar waveguide with ground. It's, a, it's, a, it's an outer layer route signal above a plane with copper on either side of it that's attached to the plane. And when you do that, you contain the fields in the cavity that's created. And it makes a good high quality waveguide to move high frequency energy through the circuit board. That's probably the best. There's other ways you can route it on inner layers and so on. But the coplanar waveguide with ground is probably the best way. First off, heat sinks are probably the worst thing when it comes to antennas. And the key is you have to keep the antenna and the heat sink as separated as you can. If your box is this big, you need for the heat sink to be over here and the antenna to be over here because this heat sink is a lot of metal and it will interfere with the antenna. And in fact, it isn't just the heat sink, the box will interfere with the antenna. Human skin interferes with antenna. Everything interferes with an antenna. So you have to keep them as isolated as you can. It can, but it doesn't have to. Um, I was talking about that just today in the class I was doing. Copper pour, if you move the poured copper too close to the trace, 
then yes, it will influence impedance. And in fact, that's what a coplanar waveguide is, is one with the copper close to the trace. Um, as long as you can keep it far enough away, if you put poured copper and keep it two times the dielectric thickness to the plane below, away from the trace, it will not impact impedance. But anything closer than that will. LCDs, the only thing that's a potential impedance problem with an LCD display is the data lines that drive the, the flicker rate of the LCD. The, the lines that drive the LCD display are really the only thing that where you have to worry about, about impedance control. What's much worse on LCD displays is the connector pin assignments that the people who design these things create. They do a terrible job. They'll put 15 or 20 signals in a connector with one or two ground pins and wonder why it's hard to prevent noise from coupling into the LCD. It's really a function of how the LCD is display is designed more than what you can do about impedance. So it's a hard question to answer. The answer is you have to look for LCD displays that have well-designed pinouts on their connectors. And that's a deep question that would require a, a little bit of time to answer, but that's really the key answer, is to find a well-designed pinout on the, on the connector. With lots of ground pins, that's the key. It's like having digital and analog on the same board. And when you do that, you have to keep them separated. I know a lot of people will intermingle the components. You can't, can't do that. And the same thing's true with high frequency oscillator circuits. You simply have to keep each one separate from the other. It's a matter of spacing between them. And how close they can get is a function of frequency and that gets pretty deep. But the key here is to just keep them far apart. When you mount a capacitor, a decoupling capacitor or whatever to a circuit board, you want to minimize inductance. Most people think that using large diameter vias is the way to accomplish low inductance. That's not true. The key to accomplishing low inductance, no matter how big the vias are, is to have them close together. So the power via and the ground via, instead of putting them at the end of the capacitor, put them on the side very close together. And even better, put two sets of them on the side. That's the key to reducing inductance. You, you can, you simply have to get it close enough to the load. It has to be within a lumped distance of the load. And like the question I answered earlier, it's a function of how fast the signal is rising and falling. If it's a 500 picosecond signal, the resistor simply needs to be within probably a half inch of the load. If it's a much faster signal, it needs to be closer. And that's really all that's necessary is to get it close enough based on the speed of the signal. It's a function of rise time and very fast rise times, the resistor needs to be very close. Slower rise times, they can be farther away. It really depends on the speed of the signal. And engineers need to look into that and determine what that speed is. And if you can't get it close enough, then you put the resistor beyond the last load and you let the resistor be the last load. And that's really the key. I tell engineers all the time to talk to their fabricators and find out from them the best way to design a board. If an engineer has done that, then obviously the fab house has to follow the instructions on the fab drawing because they're assuming the engineer listened to them, you know? If the engineer never calls you up and asks you, what's the best way to design the circuit board, then the best advice I can give a fab house is, I don't know what to tell them because it's really up to the designer, the engineer, to talk to the fab house and make sure that the two are on the same page. And if they are, all the fab house has to do is just produce the board. It's really not a fab house problem, it's an engineer problem. Back drilling is the worst idea in the history of bad ideas. There's a way to avoid it. If you have a lot of high speed lines, let's say you have a BGA here and a BGA here, 
and you need to route high speed lines between them in a very thick circuit board, the best way to get the line from here to there is to come out of this BGA all the way down deep into the board, route really far down over to here and then back up into that IC. By doing that, you end up with a stub that's so short, you don't need to back drill. So the best way to solve the back drilling problem is to not design so that it's necessary. But if it is necessary, obviously fab houses have to come up with their own thoughts on what kind of tolerance they need for back drilling. And unfortunately, designers need to understand if they don't design the circuit board to avoid back drilling, it's going to cost a lot of money. Heavy copper PCBs generally only get used in circuits where there's really high current. You don't need heavy copper for high voltage, for normal digital or analog circuits, just when there's really high currents. And the, the reality is, I'll say it again, I tell every designer I know, call the fab house, find out from them what they expect you to do. It's not up to the designer to decide what the rules are. It's up to the designer to call the fab house and ask them what are the best rules for me to follow in designing my board so that when I use heavy copper, you can produce it readily. So it's really not a fab house problem, it's a designer problem. Copper thieving is something fab houses do when circuit board designers don't balance the copper on their board. They have to use thief copper to balance the copper so they can plate the board properly. They only do it because they have to, because designers, frankly, don't know what they're doing. And the solution isn't for the fab house to have to do it, the solution is for designers to figure out how to create even copper all over their board so the fabricator doesn't have to use thief copper. Because there, there's no easy solution. When you put thief copper on a board, you end up creating the risk of electric and magnetic fields coupling to that, causing interference between circuits. So yes, fabricators do it, but they shouldn't have to. And if board designers do their job right, fabricators won't need to use thief copper. Again, it comes back on designers. Designers don't have enough knowledge in some cases to design circuit boards that are producible. And they need to, they need to learn.